Hello and welcome to another episode of The Pulse. I'm your host, Sam Redd. My guest today is Baltimore City Police Commissioner Anthony Batts and Reverend Kevin Slayton of the Mayor's Office. So don't go away. Stay tuned for The Pulse. My honored guest today is Commissioner Anthony Bass of the Baltimore City Police Department. Commissioner, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. I sincerely appreciate you having me here. Oh, we're great to have you here. Uh, Commissioner, um, yes, sir. you're in Baltimore now. Mm -hmm. um, you come from, from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, you looked at the job of, of being Commissioner of Baltimore City Police Department. When you saw the job and mm -hmm. you saw the offer, uh, what made you believe that you could make a difference as a Commissioner of Baltimore City Police Department? Well, it's not believing that I can make a difference. It's just trying to, to come and be part of the fabric, the rich fabric and history of the city of Baltimore. This is my third city. Mm -hmm. uh, I started uh, my police career in the city of Long Beach, which is in Southern California. Right. And I was there for uh, 27 years. Uh, seven of those 27 years, I was chief of police and had the ability, which is equivalent of being commissioner here on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And we as a team had the ability to turn around our relationship with the community and we uh, did a pretty good job of dropping crime pretty significantly. And my proudest moment is I, a, a number of my command staff have left and become chiefs of police of other departments. Okay. And so people have seen the success and wanted to replicate. I think it, the number was 12 different chiefs mm -hmm. of police. So uh, I went from there to Northern California because I wanted it to uh, to do something a little different and see a different in, in culture. And I went to the city of Oakland and, and had a short-term contract there. I was there two years. We did a good job of connecting with our community and, and shifting around the relationship of a very heated uh, traditional uh, relationship. And when my time came to uh, leave Oakland, uh, there was a hue and cry for me to stay. Okay. And I put that towards uh, the fact that the team itself did a better job of connecting with our community. And actually, I had retired. Uh, I did my time, Sam. I retired. I went off and bought a Harley motorcycle. Uh, to ride with my dad, who's an avid motorcycle rider, uh, and just kind of enjoy life and right. just kind of decompress. Wasn't really sure I was coming back into law enforcement. I was doing some consulting things and a fellowship with Harvard University and did some traveling to Africa and, and uh, Sweden and different places, working with governments and, and giving presentations. And then I had a, a friend ask me if I was interested in Baltimore. Uh, it wasn't really on my radar screen. Uh, and he shared the fact that Fred Bill fell. Uh, and the things that he had done and gone in the right direction was stepping down. Uh, at which time I started doing my research and because uh, the police department is going in the right direction, and a lot of the things that Fred has put in place are the things are, are, are equivalent to my style or, or uh, some of the same things I would have been doing or have done mm -hmm. in other places. And um, that time that I had retired, the year that I retired, uh, the vast majority of that time I was thinking about getting back into a uniform, right. being a police officer and doing what I do. And the nature of uh, Baltimore is, uh, I didn't grow up here, although I was born in D.C. and stayed on the East Coast until I was five, until my parents matriculated to the West Coast. But all of my family's here. So okay. on a personal basis, coming back uh, to the East Coast was coming home. Uh, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins were, were all here in this region and, and in the area. But more so on the West Coast, I grew up in South Central L.A. Right. I grew up a poor kid. I grew up struggling. I grew up uh, with a lot of dysfunctionality around me. Uh, gang violence, um, a lot of drugs, and all the other things that come with uh, growing up poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often wonder, did anybody give a darn about uh, a little kid like me? Right. I wasn't involved in gang violence. I wasn't involved in a dysfunctionality. But did anybody care if I survived? Did mm -hmm. anybody care if I, I was successful? Did anybody care, period, about my life? Did, I, did, did it have a value? And I think what has driven me, whether in Long Beach or in Oakland and now in Baltimore, is I still see, uh, much like myself, that eight-year-old little boy, right. you know, there's plenty of young people out here who want to, to survive and to go on and do better things than anybody care. Mm -hmm. I care. And so when you ask me what brings me here, is I give enough of my heart and my soul to sure. make it better for the little ones out here on these streets. And, and, and that's very important mm -hmm. as, a, as a police commissioner. And uh, I think so far in the times you've been here, the people of Baltimore have seen because you've been very visible. Mm -hmm. And we talked about gang violence. Let's sure. talk about you know how you will, uh, what do you see with the gang violence and the problems in Baltimore City? Sure, uh, what I see in Baltimore is, is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. I think um, um, people are very tough on this city. Uh, they don't give us an opportunity as they should. Uh, 
uh, one of the most important things is that, uh, as you probably know, is that we are the Super Bowl champions, right. or home of right. Super Bowl champion right. Ravens, which is uh, which is uh, kind of tells a lot about the city. You know, the Ravens went through a tough time. They came together as a whole. They struggled through it, and uh, they became successful. And I think that's what has, has to happen here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, although we have a, a very rich history here of a lot of different neighborhoods and backgrounds to those neighborhoods, the reality in the bottom line is that we're going to fail and succeed as one city, as Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to come and save us. Nobody's riding in on a, on a white horse. It has to be the city itself picking itself up by its bootstraps mm -hmm. and saying, we're going to survive, and we're going to make it, and we're going to make a difference. And when you look into post-industrial cities, you know, like the Baltimores and the Detroits right. and even the Oaklands and uh, cities like that, which have lost their economic base, and they're, trying, they're in the process of trying to replace that economic base, I think one of the main economic drivers for the city is the police department. Sure. And what we, our actions or our inactions will help uh, the city to become successful in the next five to ten years, or it would hurt the city in trying to become successful. So what I'm trying to do is, is to uh, get the message out, the human cry out to the men and women of the police department that this is greater than cops and robbers, this is greater than driving fast and, mm -hmm. and wearing the uniform, this is saving a modern, a modern uh, modern, excuse me, city today mm -hmm. and helping it become successful. Okay, and 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 how do you do that? And how do you get that message out, other than also to the to the general public, the citizens of Baltimore City, who see and believe that uh, you know if you turn on the news at night and you mm -hmm. see uh, the first five minutes or the first few seconds of the news is is murder and and violence in the city. How do you get that message out and let them know that that you're the guy that has their back with your department? Well, you know, it's two things. I think uh, the media has a responsibility sure. also. I think, uh, you know, in most cities, uh, if it bleeds, it leaves is, is a cliche that mm -hmm. they put out there. And so they want to capture uh, the viewer. And so when you have a, a, a violent story that takes place, they want to put that up to get the viewer right. to pay attention. Uh, also, uh, for newspapers, you've gone away from paper and you've gone on to uh, the computers. In order to get those electronic clicks, you have to have that headline that grabs the viewer to want it to... to uh, pay attention. But we got to watch that. We got to watch that because that's also impacting the image of the city. Mm -hmm. The reality is that uh, overall, if you look on a five-year span, crime is down. And it's been right. down uh, virtually every uh, every year for the last five to six years. And uh, the, la the year, this year that I came in, it continues to be down. Our murder rate went up because we had uh, gang violence or territorial warfare that took place. But it's still, it's, a, it's the second lowest number that we've had in, in a number of years. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like it's outrageous or going in the wrong direction. Right now, our murder rate is down, homicide rate is down, our robbery rate is down, our rapes are down, our part one, which the section is your most violent crimes, is down. And so as we, we, we continue to do that good police work, you know, you need to put that on the front line. Right. Crime is down in the city of Baltimore. Crime tends to be down in the last five years in the city of right. Baltimore because when corporations and other businesses want to move to Baltimore, when they pick up the, the newspaper or they click in on that website or they go back and look at the news reports, if it's just that violence that they see, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. This is a good city. It's going in the right, the right direction. The mayor's doing the right things and, and putting things in place and getting the right people on board and putting them in the right seats. And we have to start uh, putting that out. We tend to want to say all the bad things. And I, I don't know if it's a cultural norm, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of good things happening in the city. This is right. a beautiful city. We have our challenges. Most urban cities have their challenges. Right. But I, I am part of my, you asked me how I do it, I'm the biggest cheerleader for Baltimore. You know, okay. whether I I, uh, I just came back from Dallas where I was meeting with other major city chiefs to talk about crime issues and, and how to address crimes. My job is to say how well Baltimore is doing, and it is going in the right direction, and we're doing the right things, mm -hmm. and now we need to get everybody in a partnership on board going in the right direction. Well, let's talk about the partnerships sure. you have with other areas of law enforcement, but not only that, with the community also. Yes, with every group. It's, uh, you know, part of what I do, I think, uh, policing today is collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to have enough police officers. We're not going to be able to grow by giant numbers, and so you have to be more efficient. Right. You have to be more professional. You have to have a targeted focus. You have to have a sophisticated business business plan and that you give out to the public to say this is what I'm doing, this is the direction that I'm going, this is what you could hold me accountable for. And we're doing those things. And it's not just collaborations with other police departments, whether it's the state police, which are very helpful, mm -hmm. the MTA, uh, the Baltimore County with Jim Johnson, everyone around us, we're working very well right. with them. They help us, we help them, we go, we go back and right. forth. But uh, even with the business community, I think it's extremely important to have those partnerships to more than tell them what we're doing is to listen. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the community that pays our salaries through our tax dollars, our job is to listen and pay attention to what they say and not talk, not speak at them or down to them. And also, uh, where we have parts of our community that don't like the police department, right. uh, our job is to go in there and build those friendships and those relationships. Sure. Whether it's working with uh, uh, activists or working with the ACLU or working with the NAACP, uh, whose job is to, to make sure that we're doing the right things, mm -hmm. we're going to be open. We're going to be transparent. We're going to be honest. When we make mistakes, we're going to say we make mistakes. When we do things right, my job is to tell how well this police department is doing and the things that they're they're uh, addressing in the right direction. Hopefully, that hopefully the media will pick that up also. Okay, and, and I think that's that's very important. Now you've done something also that's been uh, I don't think ever has been done before that I can recall in the Baltimore State Police Department. You uh, appointed and made a promotion of Lieutenant Colonel uh, Melvin Russell. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what he's doing now. What yeah. his what his uh, department is doing now. Yeah, what Mel is doing, when I first came, uh, Melvin Russell was a major working in the Eastern. And what Melvin had done is, uh, in a microcosm, the same thing that I was talking about, he built partnerships and collaborations. Right. His foundation happened to be with the black churches and then from the black churches to all denominations and then uh, to the community itself. And what he used was the, the credibility of the church that was already embedded in that area and had families there for generations to come out and participate. And then he used that credibility to bring the police department in to build, to build that uh, connectivity with the police department. Mm -hmm. And when I came in, those are the same things that I've done in cities. So he's done in a, in a smaller grouping the things that I wanted to do in the city of Baltimore. And when I first met him, my eyes lit up, his eyes lit up, and I said, we need to enter into a partnership because uh, uh, you understand, you get it, you know what I'm trying to do. He's, he's working very hard and diligently in all districts, but specifically he continues in the Eastern. I have him working very diligently in the Western. We're looking at reentry programs. Mm -hmm. um, when we have our residents that are coming back into our, and I call them our residents, because they're part of the community and you just, you just can't isolate them. Right. But we're going into the prisons, we're talking and establishing relationships. Um, all the documents show that if you do not help people become successful in the first six months coming out of prison, they tend to go back to the life. So if we can get them past that first six months sure. and sustain them and support them, then they stop doing crime. Mm -hmm. So that relationship of going into uh, the jail is just not uh, icing or soft policing. Sure. It's stopping the numbers on the opposite end. It's being smart. If we establish those relationships, we do wraparound services, get them past our first year, get them on their feet, help them to get their driver's license, social security card, whatever it is to get employed, then we cut crime, long term, not short term, long term. Instead of just going in and, and making arrests, what we're trying to do is build communities. Much like the military has shifted from uh, just going in and fighting wars to going in in nation building, instead of going in just arresting people, we're going in and we're community building. That's part of what Mel Russell's in charge of. Okay, that's great, that's great. We're gonna take a, a short break sure. and when we come back, we're gonna talk about what the commissioner sees in the future in Baltimore City. Deal. Don't go away, you don't wanna miss this on The Pulse. Welcome back to The Pulse. If you're just joining us, our guest today is Commissioner Anthony Batts. So Commissioner, uh, let's talk about some of the uh, exciting things that are going on in the police department. And then also, let's hit on the fact that if I'm a, police, a young male, female, and I'm thinking about a career in law enforcement, why would I want to join the Baltimore City Police Department? Well, it's, it's funny thing for us. We're going through a revolution. It's a changing time for us. We have a, <clears throat> there's good and bad. We have a young police department because we've done a lot of hiring. Uh, that comes with mistakes because uh, any anytime you bring anyone into anything, they have right. to learn. Right. In order for them to learn, they have to make mistakes, right. and hopefully the mistakes are not so egregious that you can't recover for them. Uh, but at the same time, you get a, you get the opportunity to shape a police department because you have a young command staff and you have young officers that are coming in. You know, when I started uh, back in the early 1980s as a police officer, when I stepped into that police car, I had a computer in, in my police car, and so I had the ability to bring up information and data. In uh, 2013, our police officers don't have computers in their police cars, and we're one of the only police departments in the state of Maryland who uh, fits that bill. We're one of the, lo the largest, if not the largest, police department, and we're not automated to the degree that we right. have. The software that we have within our police organization to track data and information, and really, <clears throat> when you peel back all the things that we do, we collect data and information, and we don't have systems that are, are up to date to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're changing that. We're, we're building a system within the next uh, 14 months that will have tablets, 
much like your iPad that you have there, mm -hmm. every officer will have one of those. They will be able to bring up as much information, as much data. We're changing our systems within the police department so they're uh, up to date and they're automated. We get away from using Lotus Notes, which is uh, software from 1980s. Right. Uh, so we'll, we'll come up to speed. Uh, we're trying to rebuild the pride of this organization. Uh, to understand uh, what this patch, what this badge means, uh, the honor that uh, comes along with that. Uh, so we're, we're moving in a direction to become one of the best police departments, not only in Maryland, but best police departments in the United States. And part of that is, is that uh, our professionalism is one of the things that we're pushing very hard and diligently. That when you see this uniform, you see someone who is in shape, someone who looks good in that uniform, someone who treats you with respect, someone who's very intelligent and, and is working with the community in a collaborative form. All the things that we've talked about. But the uh, most important thing is that uh, I will not tolerate uh, misconduct within our organization. Will not tolerate corruption issues within the, within the organization. That's part, that's part of the professionalism. I brought. Uh, with me, uh, Deputy Commissioner Jerry Rodriguez, who's heading our professional standards unit, uh, where we're looking at ourselves and policing ourselves. It's very difficult to go into a uh, neighborhood and hold, hold people to a high standard if we're not holding ourselves to right. a high standard. Right. So we're pushing in that direction. I think uh, we're going in the right direction. I'm seeing the organization fall in line. So I see nothing but positives ahead. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> there's a wish list in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's the commissioner's wish list. And you get a chance to pick a couple things from this wish list to, uh, for your department and for the city. Uh, what's on that wish list? Well, the, not a couple things. Can I can I start? I got a list of about 70, 80, 90. Can I start with that? Start. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, part of it is is uh, making sure that uh, our organization uh, has all the tools to be the best and, and the brightest. Um, you know, uh, although you hear me talk about computers and, and you, you know, people at home may say, well, what significance does that have? Well, if you want to draw the best and brightest police officers, you have to have the best and brightest toys here. Right. You have to have uh, the cars that run all the time. You have to have enough cars. You have to have the computers. You have to have buildings buildings that look good. You have to have uh, the opportunities for training. You have to have the best training. Um, and as we move forward, part of that wish list is to make sure that uh, my officers, and, and, and one thing I have to say is that I'm very proud of the police officers here. Mm -hmm. They don't get enough pat on the backs. They don't get enough accolades. They don't get enough people standing up saying they really do a good job. Right. Now within that, we have some people who, who are uh, problematic, a small number of people, but the vast majority in this organization are doing the right things. So the things that my wish list is to continue to give them the tools, the skills, the training, and the investment that they can do the right thing to help this community, this wonderful city of Baltimore, grow in the right direction over the next five or ten years where the mayor wants to go. Yeah, you know, that's exciting. Um, I've had the, the privilege of working with the Baltimore City Police Department for well over 25 years now and uh, have worked with several commissioners, um, but know a lot of people in the Baltimore City Police Department and see the dedication mm -hmm. that they, like you said earlier, the media doesn't always mm -hmm. talk about. Um, when I hear about uh, a police officer who is uh, bilingual mm -hmm. and gives a special time yes. to go and help out and to interpret a yes. situation that uh, when he's not even working. Yes. Um, and I hear about, and I've seen the police officers go out and get their own money yes. out of their pockets to young kids to get a, a piece of candy or something yes. in the summertime or when they're on the street with them. So we know what a great program mm -hmm. and Buddy's mm -hmm. Night mm -hmm. that you all have with mm -hmm. your with your program. Great. So, you know, it's, it's a shame that we don't hear more about the police yeah. department. But uh, and we we hear about the bad stuff. Well, part of we have, what we have to do is, is set up a form that we get it out more and not count on uh, other parts to get it out for us, whether through. And we have a great Twitter account. So right. go on our Twitter account, our Facebook. And that's where you see a lot of the positives that are out there. We have uh, BaltimorePD.com. Uh, okay. Um, uh, also our, our TV show. And uh, we have a, a young man here, Vernon, who uh, mm -hmm. uh, does my hosting of that show. And right. come on and take a look at some given point in time. And, well, we, we, we've seen. Um, Officer Vernon do a great job what he does with your department, your whole media department. Everyone doing a great job. Good, but good. Um, I want to thank you for jumping in Absolutely. head first in Baltimore City. Um, needless to say, we, we welcomed you here yes, and uh, you walked into a, a Super Bowl. Yes, sir. And you, you got the Preakness not too long yes, ago. Sir. And hopefully we'll get a World Series for you yep. when you get now that you're here. But oh, uh, we want to we want to thank you for the uh, for coming to Baltimore. Uh, thank you and for allowing me to be a part. we look forward to a great relationship and partnership with you here in Baltimore City. Deal. All right. Thank great. you, Thank sir. you, Commissioner. All right. Don't go away. You don't want to miss more on The Pulse.
we intend to unite the entire faith-based community in taking a stand against domestic violence. During Domestic Violence Awareness Month, specifically October 25th to the 27th, we hope to have every member of the clergy, of every faith, of every denomination, commit to do something in their congregation to raise the awareness of the problem, of the methods of prevention, and of the resources available to those suffering. Welcome back to The Pulse. Joining me now is Reverend Kevin Slayton of the Mayor's Office. Reverend, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Mr. Red. Now, your job with the Mayor's Office is? Faith-based liaison. And, 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 the, and you're here today because the Mayor and the Governor have a, uh, an interfaith uh, task force on domestic violence. Let's talk about yeah, that. The, um, the mayor was approached by Judge Karen Friedman mm -hmm. last year, um, and the judge had seen considerable um, differences in the courts right. with regards to domestic violence. Right. It was an issue close to her heart, asked the mayor if she'd be willing to participate. Mm -hmm. and of course, the mayor obliged, and um, through partnering with the governor's Office of Community Initiatives, we were able to get together and sort of chart out a course towards October, mm -hmm. which is going to be um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Right. Now, now, who are the players um, and the people that are participating in this uh, in this uh, task force? Well, we did uh, not to use a, a biblical term, but we did cast a broad net, mm -hmm. um, and so at our initial launch event last week at the uh, Volmer Center, we had imams from. Um, Earl El Amin, mm -hmm. Rabbi Bush, uh, Rabbi Fink, uh, to local clergy, uh, Pastor Lance over at uh, Mount Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And so we just basically reached out to every every faith. Mm -hmm. um, the, the core reason for reaching out to the faith community was for many people who find themselves victims of abuse, oftentimes the last place, um, or maybe, maybe the first place that they want to look to for some resource is their faith institution. Right, right. Um, Dr. Miles Monroe, mm -hmm. someone who I appreciate, a pastor in Texas, um, has written extensively on domestic violence, and particularly in the black church. Right. He argues that on any given Sunday, about a third of the congregation may suffer from verbal, physical, mental abuse. Right. And ultimately, there has been a silence, he says, mm -hmm. in the pulpit on that issue. So I particularly remember in one of my classes at seminary at Howard, we talked about the idea of a, a woman who, who arises on a Sunday morning. She mm -hmm. feeds the children, she takes out the dog, um, she makes breakfast, she gets everybody dressed up looking well, they get right. in the car, they show up to the faith institution, and while they are singing, pass me not, O gentle Savior, she's like, does anybody see my pain? Right. And she walks away from that service and nobody sees her pain because in everyone's else eyes, she looks picture perfect. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, she's suffering from domestic violence. Part of that fear is, if I raise the question to the leadership, what can they really do? And right. do they know what to do? Right. This partnership is helping to plug that gap. Okay, so the partnership is going to train the, the faith community um, and those in the church on how to address the situation yes. in and around the, in the church, but it's also in the community yeah. also. Primarily linking them to the right place to ah, go. Okay. Um, the reality is, is a, a large uh, portion of what is required mm -hmm. to address the issue, the institution does not possess. Mm -hmm. But they do have the wherewithal to make good decisions in pointing folks in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the partnership is about. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll have training for, for these uh, persons in the church and for the clergy? There will be training available through the partners. Okay. Um, of course, there are House well, of let's Ruth. Let's talk about who, who, are some like, of the, who are some of the partners. Well, you have House of Ruth, you have a number of nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Some churches actually have the staff within, right. but an overwhelming majority just don't have it. Um, and so I think one of the examples that was used um, last week was, was a woman who had gone to her pastor. Um, I think in Colorado, mm -hmm. told the pastor, you know, that her husband, you know, she thought maybe they could get back together, and right. he said, well, let's come in and do, you know, pastors, that's what we want to do, come right. into the office, let's sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. um, and as a red flag, they probably should not have been in one another's company. Mm -hmm. You know, the training will be across that board, nothing too intense because the psychological 
uh, parameters of it just may be a bit overwhelming again for right. lay, lay leadership as well as clergy. But what are the necessary te steps you can take and point folks in the right direction? Now, is law enforcement involved with this also? Law enforcement has not gotten involved at this point yet. Right. Uh, again, a lot of folks ask, why are you launching this so far right. out? Right. Um, and again, it was a sort of build up momentum. Mm -hmm. the judge had, had the foresight to say, okay, well let's look at the entire month of October. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's give folks a lead in as opposed to just saying, you know, next Sunday is this, and it really doesn't get the t attention it needs. But moving forward, hope to have some workshops, trainings, et cetera. Now, now when, once you launch this, uh, is it gonna be like a, a media campaign, let folks know about this? and what, and what churches can get involved and how the churches can get involved. Exactly. One of the primary partners will be um, MTA. Okay. And we want to use, utilize the bus right. bus signs. Channel 25, mm -hmm. I mean, we're definitely appreciative sure. to you um, for having us on. But also the pulpit. Mm -hmm. That's going to be, that's the biggest platform there is. You know, folks go to church. At, good folks go to church. Not right. that bad folks don't, but a good church members should go at least right. four times a month, you right. would think. Right. So that's that's good advertising. Sure, sure. You know. now, now what about um, as far as the, uh, they don't have to just be in the church to be a part of this, they can be from the community also, right? Of course, we would hope so. Um, I have found in my experience that most of the resources provided, particularly by our churches in Baltimore City, are accessed by folks outside of the faith right. community. Right. So you may see a church uh, in Harlem Park or in Druid Hill community, and most of its giveaways, be they food, clothing, et cetera, mm -hmm. go to 95% of the people in the community. Mm -hmm. This resource would be no different. Okay, Let, let's, let's step aside a minute mm -hmm. and talk about what you do with the mm -hmm. mayor's office and as a, the faith-based liaison mm -hmm. for the mayor's office. Let's talk about that a minute. Sure. How do you work with the, you work with the churches and the community and what? I do, Sam, it was, it was interesting my entry into this position came just shortly after my, um, what we would call in, in my denomination, a call into ministry mm -hmm. and me accepting that call. Um, having known the mayor for a while, having been a lobbyist, mm -hmm. um, just been involved politically, I was going away. So I'm doing this faith thing and I'm not doing the political stuff. Right. Um, and so the position and the opportunity to be a faith-based liaison just sort of made good sense. Mm -hmm because so much of our politics uh, runs through our faith community. Sure. Uh, and so much of what the faith community wants to impact often needs the assistance of government. Right. And so for this administration, I'm fortunate the mayor and I attended the same church mm -hmm. um, at the time, Douglas Memorial Community Church. It just made sense that we brought to bear right. our likes and similarities in faith to what it was she was um, pursuing in government. And the mayor has a great relationship with the faith community. Oh, tremendously. And I mean, as I see, you yeah. see her at, uh, at many services. Oh, yeah. um, you see her uh, calling on the clergy mm -hmm. for, uh, for partnerships yeah. and a lot of things around Baltimore yeah, Yesterday, City. I mean, she woke up and we decided to just pop in um, over at uh, Pennsylvania AME oh, because okay. it was Pastor McCorn's anniversary. And right. that was just something, I mean, he, he refers to the church now as the city's church. The mayor sees every church uh, every mosque, every synagogue. Right. Right. Um, and, and that's another piece too, is okay. that it's not just the Protestant church. Uh, okay. Of course, that's the predominant one in the city, but you know, there are a number of faiths and, right. and the mayor's conscious of all of them. Well, ne well let's, let's, let's hope that this, this, uh, this initiative on domestic violence, I think a, pe a lot of people definitely uh, have a blind eye to, yeah. to domestic violence, yeah. and, and especially when it's, and, and it could be right there under the nose in, their com in the congregation or in the community. If there's anyone that's watching uh, from a church or a clergy that's watching and wants to get in touch with you on, uh, and be a part of how can they reach you? Yeah, they can contact me. Visit uh, baltimorecity.gov, go to the mayor's page and look for Kevin Slayton or they can just email me, kevin.slayton at baltimorecity.gov. Well, good luck. Thank you for uh, thank you for what you do in the city. Thank uh, you. I see man. you everywhere uh, yeah. all the time with, uh, the, golf with course, the churches. Right? Not on the golf course, <laughs> but we see you working hard out there in the community. We want to thank you for what you do, um, and also the uh, the uh, what you do as far as the clergy in Baltimore City. Also, Thanks, all right. Don't go away. You don't want to miss more on the pulse.
I want to thank my guests today, Commissioner Batts and Reverend Kevin Slate, for coming on the show and sharing such valuable information. And congratulations to all graduates out there this year. And as always in parting, stay safe, stay informed, and keep your finger on the pulse of our community.